Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Um, welcome uh, to our Institutional Repositories Roundtable. I am Cynthia Holt, the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Um, just a few housekeeping things to start before I turn things over to our moderator. Um, first, uh, this is being recorded. So it will be uh, put up on the call website and YouTube channel uh, shortly after the end of the session. Uh, as registrants, you will all be notified once the recording is up there. Uh, also, if you could turn off your video unless you are presenting or speaking at the time, uh, just to save bandwidth for some of our folks coming in from low bandwidth areas. Uh, also, uh, if you can mute uh, during the session, unless you're asking a question, um, uh, please do so. That also helps with uh, uh, minimizing some distractions in the background. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our moderator today, Julie Morris, who is the Collections Analysis and Bibliometrics Librarian at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, Julie. Thank you very much, Cynthia. So my name is Julie Morris. My pronouns are they, them. As Cynthia mentioned, I'm the Collections Analysis and Bibliometrics Librarian at UMB. I'm also the chair of the CALL CBPA Scholarly Communications Committee. I want to start today with a land acknowledgement. CALL CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our, li our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit, of Nunatsivut and Nunatukavut, the Inu of Nitasinin, uh, the Beotuk and the Mi'kmaq people. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. In New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Willistiquig, the Mi'kmaq, and the Passamaquoddy peoples. We at CALL CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Today, we're pleased to welcome you to a roundtable discussion on institutional repositories. We're welcomed by Jeff Brown, who's the Digital Scholarship Librarian at Dalhousie University, and Peter Webster, who's the Associate University Librarian of, of Information Systems at St. Mary's University, both in Halifax. We'll start today with a discussion with Jeff and Peter as they share their experiences with their own institutional repositories. They will discuss issues such as their institution strategies, successes and challenges, and, any, and some advice for running um, institutional repositories at your own institutions. After that, we'll open the floor to questions and answers with Jeff and Peter. So we'll ask you to maybe hold your questions until the end. Following that, if there is time, um, we'll, uh, we'll open the floor to anyone on the call to um, raise questions to the user community and to draw from each other's expertise. I have some questions already prepared, um, but I'd like to keep this fairly informal um, so we can just uh, share as much as as much as we like with each other. And um, I'm going to just uh, turn things over to our first presenter, who is Jeff, Jeff Brown from Dalhousie University. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being here. No problem, Julie. Thanks for inviting me. Do you have slides or are you going to be? No, I'm, well, I turning? have some just for okay. speaking notes, but I just figured speaking you notes, could look great. at me the whole time and I'll just read from my slides. That's that great. Works. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. All right, thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, so I thought I would just uh, I'd share a little bit about how we've used our IR over the years, which we call DAL Space, um, and conveniently enough, we're a DSpace site. So I'll talk a little bit about why we stayed with uh, DSpace the entire time for using our IR, and I'll focus um, mostly on the people side of things because that's the area that I. Uh, more or less work in. I'm not a system administrator or anything like that. So I just work on the people side and the relationships. So I'll focus on that. So I'll talk a bit about our public facing uh, content guidelines, who's eligible 
to to uh, contribute material to our IR. The, uh, I'll talk a bit about our um, more important collections, like our thesis collection and, of course, our scholar collections as well. So, um, in terms of just to give you some historical context of how long we've been doing this, we installed DSpace at Dalhousie in 2007, uh, and when we originally installed it, the idea was um, to support green open access to articles was the first thing. And then the second thing was to host local uh, digital library collections. So over the years, I'm, like many uh, university libraries, I, I would imagine, uh, you know, we sort of accumulated a bunch of, of digital collections and materials, photograph collections, and we just want a, a place to park that. So we didn't really have a fully formed idea of how we wanted to use this, um, but that was sort of the initial thought. And we more or less just played with it for a couple of years. Uh, but we got serious with it in 2010 when our faculty of graduate studies uh, asked about uh, using DAL space for theses. So we um, we did that kind of on a trial basis for a year in 2010. And uh, in 2011, the faculty of graduate studies came back to us and said that went really well. We'd like to do this um, permanently. So um, thesis deposit in our IR became mandatory in, in uh, 2011 and they we ceased uh, uh, print thesis altogether so we had to kind of get you know the first couple of years we were kind of playing around with our IR and then we had to get serious about it in in 2011 when uh, we were sort of the version of record for Dalhousie thesis and so uh, fast forward to 2024 we're still using DSpace uh, we're currently upgrading uh, from version 5.7 to 7.6 so that's like our latest uh, thing so that's sort of like a short history of um, the our sort of use of the IR at Dalhousie. Now, uh, historically, it served, um, as I alluded to there, three sort of slightly different purposes. So on the one hand, it's it's been used as an open access institutional repository, collecting outputs of Dalhousie scholars, staff, and administrators. On the other hand, we've used it as a digital library. So we, get, uh, we keep digital surrogates of library held print collections. We also keep, um, so we have a couple of other production environments we use for things like OER. Uh, so we do, we use press books uh, as a production environment for OER, but we store static copies of our OER in, uh, in DAL space as well. And we also keep uh, journal back files. You know, we have a publishing program in open journal system and systems, and we keep sort of our back files uh, of those journals in uh, DAL space too. So it serves this sort of uh, quasi digital library function as well to this day. The other type of material we, we put in there are our uh, student work. So the graduate thesis collection is, is one part of that, but we also work with departments to accept undergraduate, usually course-based work in there as well. So three slightly different purposes that we use the IR for. And in terms of, of discovering things in there, so I always position, uh, I position DAL space as a kind of storage locker that's indexed by Google. And so I always, I feel like we have a bit of an advantage over, you know, library catalogs in that regard, where that's like a very tightly controlled metadata environment. And and uh, anyone who's used a D, uh, an IR knows that it's not a very tightly controlled metadata environment. So, but despite that, I think we have it, we're, we're discoverable at web scale in a way that library catalogs just aren't. So we have a, a leg up despite ourselves uh, in terms of discovery. We don't really expect people to go to DAL space though as a destination and start searching for things. Certainly they can do that sort of thing there, but um, it's not what drives most of the traffic to our IR. It's usually web searches. So web searches leading to specific items. We do encourage a minimal amount of metadata um, and we probably allow too much, but people really like to add metadata to their submissions. So we let them do that. But um, if it was up to me, and, and it is slightly up to me, but more or less, uh, we, tr we try to keep it to a minimum, and I would like to even accept less metadata from users. But anyway, we are, we are where we are, and, and we certainly don't accept a lot of metadata with submissions. So I just want to address why we stuck with, with DSpace all these years. It's, it's a very stable and well-organized uh, open source software project, I would say. I've, I've experienced with others. Um, but DSpace is very stable. It does the basics well out of the box um, and with no real, uh, you know, some sites do a lot of development work with their DSpace. We haven't, and it's worked quite well for us. Uh, it certainly facilitates 
version upgrades when you haven't done a lot of development work with your IR. So that's the sort of path we've chosen. It also supports the handle system and we're committed to our handles as sort of critical digital infrastructure. So that's a big reason why we stuck with, with, uh, with DSpace and we wouldn't migrate to a, a system that can't, can't use or support our handles. So that's that's important for us. The other thing is, is we're really comfortable with the, the workflows in DSpace and how easy it is to integrate um, non-specialist users into a workflow. So that's worked really well for us as well. So for all of those reasons, and probably a few more, we've stuck with DSpace. In terms of our, our public facing content guidelines, um, We've, we've uh, really largely stayed consistent since 2007. We came up with a set of guidelines and they've kind of continued to serve us well. Um, basically, uh, we cast the net wide. We're not overly restrictive. We just basically say the content must be scholarly, research oriented or uh, administrative in scope. Um, it shouldn't be ephemeral. So we don't want people coming back and deleting things uh, and at or requesting that things be removed in a couple of years. Uh, we also let people know that uh, stuff that they're putting in there, this isn't like a production environment. So we had to let people know that, right? So basically their content should be um, complete and ready for distribution. And it's not a good spot for living documents and collaborative working and things like that. Now that's not to say like, of course we can, we can put different versions of an article on the same item record, for example, and it works quite well for that. So for in a, the context of like preprints, post prints, published versions, things like that. But, but basically not a good spot for when you're developing documents or reports. Uh, and then the final thing we, we sort of more or less say, and I'm, I'm just sort of simplifying our content guidelines here is, uh, but basically contributor, it's gotta be the kind of content that the contributor is allowed to put in. Cause we, uh, we have a non-exclusive distribution license that everyone who submits an item has to sign off on. And so it's basically, it's gotta be content that you're allowed to submit. So basically that's, that's our, those are our content guidelines in a nutshell. Again, we cast the net widely. We do the same thing in terms of who can contribute content as well. So in terms of who's eligible to contribute, basically Dalhousie faculty members, researchers, administrators, and staff, essentially anyone who works at Dow can, can uh, submit content. Students are permitted to submit content, but only into specific collections that are authorized by Dalhousie faculty members. And I'll explain a little bit of that in, uh, in, in a few minutes, but uh, essentially individual students don't come to us, but uh, whole courses and professors will come to us uh, to collect to um, submit, say, usually it's a course-based collection. So that's what that's how we handle things on the student side, in addition to the, the grad studies theses. And then uh, we have an adoptive collection for external scholars who don't have a repository at their own institution. So this was an initiative, I think it was Carl a, a whole bunch of years ago, wanted sort of regional um, repositories to sort of say, hey, you, would you accept, um, you know, um, People works from people who don't have a, an IR at their institution. So we put our hands up. I will say that, uh, so we've been, that's probably, we've been running that for probably about 10 years. We've only ever had one item submitted to that collection. So there was never really a, a groundswell of interest in it. I will also say that we did have an institution come to us and ask if they could use that collection. And that wasn't really the spirit within which we sort of developed that. It was really for individuals. So. Um, I don't think we, we definitely weren't set up to handle a whole other institution's adoptive collection, but uh, certainly it's still open for, for anyone who's um, who needs to use it. So basically, pretty much anyone uh, can submit. So I'll just talk about some of the collections that uh, like feature some of the, our more prominent collections. Um, we have that graduate studies thesis collection. That's about 500 items a year, I would say, is, accounts for about I'm going to say half of the total submissions to our IR. And this is a collection where um, we work really closely with the faculty of, of, of graduate studies. They really play the lead role um, on pretty much everything related to student submissions in that collection. So they handle the entire workflow with students. Um, when student comes in to submit, they give multi-stage approvals, they give final approval. And it's one of the uh, few collections where uh, ent an entity outside the library gives final approval for something to display in the IR. Um, where the library does play a lead role in that thesis collection is respect to ongoing management. Um, 
of the collection and access. And also we're the sort of key collaborator with Library and Archives Canada for the thesis Canada Harvest. So, um, but you know, I, I work quite regularly with, there's a dedicated thesis clerk in graduate studies. Uh, that's who I work with. And then grad studies works with all of the students. We wouldn't be able to keep up with all of that. So it, it, it's an arrangement that works quite well. Uh, I mentioned we also take undergraduate work in there. So th those are um, typically we'll do a course based collection. So we don't permit individual students can't come to us and request a collection. It has to come from their professors. And so we typically will do this for um, undergraduate capstone courses uh, and honors thesis programs and things like that. So we create a workflow whereby the professor is reviewing all of the student submissions and, and then approving those those uh, those submissions. So that collection is not comprehensive, right? So our, our graduate thesis collection is comprehensive. This uh, student-based coursework is just on a on request basis. So that, that really pretty much sums up the type of student work we, we get in uh, Dell space. The other sort of major collecting area are, I call them our scholar collections. Those are the, the collections that we spin up for individual researchers or professors or administrators who want to contribute um, material to Dow space. So we'll, um, that typically comes in as an email request to our Dow space email address. We'll get an email from a researcher and say, hey, I, I'd like to contribute to Dow space. How do I get going with that? Uh, I'll create a collection. I send everyone an, uh, an introductory email that basically says, great, got a collection set up for you. Here's how you log in. This is the minimal metadata that we'd like you to put in. Uh, and oh, there's this like great site called Sherpa Romeo where you can uh, make sure you're not breaking any rules related to what your publisher requires. So you're not submitting something that you're not permitted to submit. And so they go off and then them, when they submit, library staff actually remove, uh, review and approve all of those incoming uh, submissions. And we do a double check of Sherpa Romeo just to make sure because Sherpa Romeo, like it's a really great resource, but it's sometimes difficult to decode what they're saying. So it usually takes, you know, if we've got a new person with a new collection, it takes them a while to get up to speed on that. So it's great to have the library as a second set of eyes on on those submissions and usually once they get rolling on that there's there's not really a lot of problems but when when they first start there's usually a number of questions that come up they usually nod their head and say yeah i understand everything then they go away and it turns out they didn't understand a whole ton of the sherpa romeo piece and then so that's why we review it so we review it and if they have if questions uh, come up um then we just respond to them so in terms of who we have like as a as, as a team working on uh Dow space on the library side of things. We have a library based IT department that handles all of the uh, system admin work. Um, I manage relationships with contributors, like whether it be uh, faculty of graduate studies or individual contributors. I'm supported by two library assistants who do all of the approvals for all of the submissions. I manage the relationship with Library and Archives Canada for the thesis harvests. And I kind of keep like, I'm not like a metadata person, but I kind of and the, a set of eyes on that just to make sure that um, things don't get too out of, out of hand. We do have a, a number of years ago, we installed um, a plugin from a company called Atmire. So Atmire does a number of plugins for DSpace installations. We installed the uh, metadata plugin and that has ser actually served us quite well in cleaning up a number of metadata messes over the years. We don't use it a lot, but when you need it, it's a great tool. I actually don't know if that's going to work with the new version of DSpace version 7. So hopefully there's some built-in tools to DSpace uh, version 7 that we can, if if the plugin doesn't work, hopefully we can continue to manage um, the metadata side of things, at least in a reasonable way. Uh, we do have a whole Skull comms team at Dow who are now working on that migration. So there's about, I think there's seven of us in total probably with eyes on the migration. And that's sort of our, our most significant thing that we're working on right now. And just to wrap up, I would say uh, lessons learned after 16 years of use. Uh, I would say slow and the slow and steady approach has worked well for us. I'm kind of glad we played around with it in the early years and sort of kicked the tires on it. Um, but you know, um, slow and steady was definitely the right way to do it. I think um, 
I will say there was some pressure over the years to kind of, it, and it's less so these days because there are more purpose-built tools for everything. But I think um, somewhere around five or six years ago, there was a lot of pressure to you, use your IR for pretty much everything. It seemed like you know current research information systems, we had a faculty profiles thing. People were asking about using it for research data management. And so anything that doesn't really feel like a good fit, I'm kind of like, we, ha we haven't really moved forward with those sorts of things. And I'm kind of glad that we hadn't. Um, I would say don't try to do everything all at once. Keep your IR manageable. Um, and I will also say don't ever fear being swamped by professors uh, looking to submit content. So like even when there was like the uh, tri-council funding agencies mandate uh, for green open access in 2015, I think we were kind of holding our breath a little bit. And going, oh my gosh, are we going to be like swamped by like all these people? But like, th there was no swamping. There was just, there was like you know a steady uh, trickle, I would say, and and that's fine. Like people people will come to you when they're ready, and so I think that's the important thing with an IR. So anyway, uh, that's been our experience. Um, I think I'll just pass it over to Peter now. All right. Jeff, that's that was terrific. An awful lot of what you had to say, I will mirror. Um, I think you know there are definitely some differences between um, your approach to the IR and ours. Uh, you know, the the most striking one that uh, you know that I see immediately. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And hopefully we'll get that working correctly. Somebody let me know if you are now seeing my uh, yes, we are. Yep. Slides. Okay, good stuff. Um, yeah, RI institutional repository lives in the archives. A huge amount of the work that's been done on it has been done by Hansel Cook, our librarian and university archivist. Um, so, you know, credit really goes to him. Because it came out of, um, you know, an interest in digitizing existing archival collections, um, it, it's had a, you know, somewhat different growth. People tend to think of institutional repositories as first and foremost, uh, you know, a place for, um, you know, your open access to scholarly articles and publications from your institution. Those are certainly in our institutional repository. Um, <clears throat> student theses, the thesis submission process for St. Mary's is now born digital and all theses go into, um, you know, all graduate and postgraduate theses go into uh, into the institutional repository. Um, but those are not the only thing that um, the repository is there for, and they're not really the first thing that that caused the creation of the repository. We are also a DSpace shop. Um, we're running DSpace six three, I think. Um, and also, we have a smaller team working on the transition to DSpace 7. So um, DSpace it has its strengths and its weaknesses, but I, I think you know the things that Jeff said about it, um, I would I would concur with. It, it's a it's a robust platform. It gives us permanent handle uh, identifiers um, that are persistent. Um, you know, it has many advantages. Um, but our collection is is really a collective. One of the huge differences between us and Dow is we do all of our intake and curation ourselves. That we're not um, giving accounts to anyone who, you know, other than the library uh, staff who is uploading. So we are uploading faculty articles, we're uploading theses, we're uploading collections that either people have brought to us or we've gone out and solicited. Um, but the management of those, the assignment of metadata. Um, is is in the hands of the library. Um, but over 40 um, different collections, a large collection of digital photographs. And that was that was one of the real impetus for um, for creating the IR was to make that wealth of historical photographs available um, you know online. Um, 
a large collection of oral histories, the interviews with prominent people from the university, um, and really, you know, preserving that, you know, that the, you know, that that oral record. Those those were originally on tape and and you know got digitized. Um, but then we've taken in all manner of um, you know of of things that people needed a place to permanently deposit. What Jeff said about it not being, for the most part, um, you know, a, a a place for living uh, documents, documents that were still in creation. It is intended to be a, a final deposit. Um, but I would say, with things like photographs, uh, there are new photographs of of graduations every year. Uh, there are new, you know, news, um, uh, you know, um, material about the university. New material is coming, born digital, into the to the archives all the time. And um, you know, so those collections continue to grow. Um, you get specialty collections. We have a collection of um, of archaeological site reports from around Halifax that a St. Mary's uh, researcher um, was involved in creating those, had those available. We wanted to make them widely available, so we digitized them. The Lynn Jones. Um, <clears throat> African Canadian Diaspora Heritage Collection um, is a large archival collection, most of paper material, um, but a sample of the Lynn Jones has been digitized and it it's a way to promote that collection. It's a way to at least in part make that that collection digitally accessible. Um, so the the institutional repository gets used for it's a say a really wide variety of purposes. I'm going to try and jump to the web page now, and let's see. Okay, you should now be seeing. <clears throat> The opening page for DSpace is that yes is that the case okay um, so this is this is a live institutional repository um, Jeff spoke about that um, you know simple but flexible uh, structure that DSpace gives where at the top level you have the basic group of of communities um, and you can see the collections that um, you know that things are grouped into large group of things under university archives but also the theses collection, um, faculty articles and, and other works, book chapters and what have you. Um, we have, because we have an affiliation with the Atlantic School of Theology, um, we do have a section in there for them. Um, but the layer below communities is the collections layer where you get um, you know, a more detailed look at all of the different, um, uh, you know, collections that, uh, and as I say, some of these are things that people have come to us and needed a, a place for um, <clears throat> publications that were created either at St. Mary's or in affiliation with St. Mary's. These are not things that have their own platform and a lot of them are not ongoing any longer, but you know, we did want to preserve them. So there are a number of journal publications, um, conference proceedings. Um, <clears throat> university institutional documents. And again, um, we would have worked closely with the university senate to um, to initially get those um, digitized, but again, most of that stuff is born digital now. So that, you know, that's this is an ongoing record. Um, the theses, and again, the theses have a whole university-wide process for students submitting their theses, getting them marked and approved, and then them coming to the archives so that they can they can be, uh, you know, they can put be put into the to the repository. Um, and then our all of the archival collections, and that includes research projects, you know, the same sort of stuff that Jeff was talking about. The difference is that, you know, we typically take the stuff in, curate it. Some of it is older material, things like, um, you know, the Burke Gaffney, famous astronomer at uh, at St. Mary's. Um, 
that's a that was originally a paper archival fund, which has been um, you know a, a lot of the materials been digitized. Um, same with the Lynn Jones collection came to us as an as an archival uh, collection. Um, so as I say, really quite an collect an eclectic mix of uh, of materials. As I say, some of my favorites are the all of the historical photographs. Um, you guys are seeing the PowerPoint again. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, you should be seeing photograph of uh, Reverend Burke Gaffney uh, on the roof of one of our buildings in 1957. Um, uh, students, yeah. yeah, students from St. Mary's at this point, St. Mary's College, not on the current campus, but on the old Windsor campus, um, preparing for war in 1940. So just a, the range of the historic photographs that um, you know that we've been able to make available. Um, uh, people receiving honorary degrees and of course when Linda Carvery uh, came to receive her honorary degree she brought her choir with her um, the Nova Scotia Mass, uh, Mass Choir um, Major General uh, McKenzie receiving his honorary degree so as I say um, a, a wonderful particularly for the university uh, you know a wonderful historical collection um, but this is material that gets used um, anytime, you know, a, a person associated with St. Mary's is in the news, we're often surprised at the ways in which, um, um, you know, things get pulled out of the institutional repository. As everything Jeff said about the fact that we don't see this as the primary interface for people getting access to, uh, to this material, um, it's a repository, um, Google, and other approaches are, you know, are the primary way in which information, uh, you know, it's in the repository, gets located and gets used. Um, a number of the featured collections, and this is the the homepage for the Lynn Jones, um, are promoted with their own, you know, web presence, um, and then material from them gets, you know, gets linked into the repository, um, but. The repository is is linked out in a whole variety of ways. Everything in it and all of the fonts associated with it are listed in the Nova Scotia, what's called Memory NS, the Nova Scotia um, Archival Database, which is a you know is a is a um, finding aid um, database for all of the archives in Nova Scotia. Um, Hansel Cook is pretty involved with with Memory NS, so it, it makes sense that. He made sure that his his archival material is all cross-referenced in there, so people can find it on our institutional repository, or they can find it in Memory NS and link across to it. Um, it's also um, we have an automatic harvest by um, by the the OAI uh, uh, PMH uh, Oyster Harvester, um, which OCLC runs um, to harvest harvest archival materials from thousands and thousands of uh, of Dublin core um, you know metadata um, repositories so again if people want to find our records in oyster um, and that's an automatic link where their system just comes in and uh, and crawls um, new records from uh, you know from our and they you know they're set up to do that with any dspace repository um, but again as Jeff said, probably the primary access point for the institutional repository is the web. Um, a couple of link outs to, uh, you know, photographs of Lester Pearson at St. Mary's University um, doing something there in 1959. Um, and again, when we look at our, at our web traffic, we're often surprised to see, um, you know, where people have pulled material. To, Hansel tells me that on occasion he'll see You'll see a, a photograph pulled off his institutional repository about you know some prominent figure, um, that, you know, and he knows that that's where it came from, um, but someone has simply found it with a web search, and that's you know that's the intention. Um, briefly about the uh, 
Uh, the workflow, uh, as I say, we do all of the intake ourselves. Um, we don't pass that over to any of the users. So the thesis submission process, as I say, campus-wide um, worked out as a matter of policy with all the university departments um, so that digital copies of the theses come to us um, and get input into the repository. Um, new collections, uh, you know, possible archival collections, either did, uh, paper that might be digitized or, you know, born digital, um, either come to us or, and sometimes we go and solicit them. We find something that we think ought to have a more permanent reposit or ought to have more of an online presence um, and a lot of the material that's in the repository you know we have we have solicited obviously with any archives um, it's also a matter of being prepared to say no so curation is about picking things that should be included and um, having to let you know other things that we simply don't have the resources to handle um, not get included um, and that's always the case with archives. Um, faculty article recruitment. <clears throat> Initially, we did a huge amount of contacting the faculty. As, as Jeff said, um, we did not have a flood of faculty coming and saying, I know I have an obligation to make my material openly available and I'm, I'm here to do so. Uh, it is a trickle. We do get faculty coming to us on occasion, but we also have a process where we are collecting a record of the scholarship um, that's being produced at this university. Um, we're making a list anyways. Um, we then check it for um, copyright compliance. Um, and, uh, you know, so immediately things that, um, you know, publisher rights are going to you know, enable us to put them up, then they, they can go into the repository. Other things get flagged that, you know, they have an embargo period and they can go in say two years after publication. Um, and, um, you know, so it's definitely a, um, a back and forth process between us soliciting things from faculty and faculty bringing materials to us. Um, and then quite a, a wide group of, of different uh, organizations, different departments within the library look after the, um, you know, the work of the repository. Copyright clearance is handled by the, you know, copyright uh, department in, you know, in the library um, and making, you know, sure that we have clearance to put stuff up and then deciding what sort of, you know, rights should be assigned to it. Um, Digital materials input gets handled both by archives staff and by um, by library cataloging or metadata staff. Um, and then digitization of non-digital items is ongoing with mostly with archives staff. Um, we the process we use for metadata is that you know either archive staff or um, you know staff who are receiving scholarly articles get material in and they they do a summary job of of getting you know the basics of the of the Dublin core tags assigned uh, you know the title and the name of the author and what have you but then our metadata um you know more senior metadata team go through on when they have time enhance the metadata make sure that it's going to be compliant with say the oyster harvest um and um you know, and and add to it and and improve it and just um, you know again um, you know do a qual some quality control. So that's it for me, and I will stop sharing and turn things back over to Julie. Great, thank you so much, Peter and Jeff. The, the, those are very comprehensive. Um, views into your IRs at your institutions, and uh, I think we all learned a lot. So now I'm going to just uh, jump over to Q&A because uh, it looks like there are some questions in the chat. Um, the first one comes from Jasmine Hoover, who I believe is at CBU. Uh, this question is for Jeff because I have to leave early. Unfortunately, Jasmine's probably left by now, but um, they might catch up on the, uh, the recording. How did the Senate docs end up in D space? That's something we had wondered about doing with our IR. 
Yep. So we have uh, actually Senate older Senate and board documents in Dell space and that came through the archives. So in the early days, the archives was uh, one of the primary, you know, and I mentioned first when we installed these spaces, we weren't really getting any green open access. So the archival collections were the, sort of a focus. And so board and Senate minutes that were in the archives collections came in uh, at that time. Current, because I think I think there was also an additional question further on that may relate to this slightly. There was someone asking about administrative records. So we don't like, there's a lot, we're not using our IR for administrative records right now. Uh, we do have uh, a records manager at Dow, so administrative records would normally be handled with the records management office now. But in the early days, we just had some older administrative type material. And so when I mentioned in the content guidelines, we allow administrative content. That's kind of what I was referring to as older sort of administrative documents. Yep. Great, thank yeah, you. Know we don't have as robust a a uh, document uh, you know a, a records management uh, um <laughs> uh, approach as 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 dalhousie does so um you know my understanding is that um you know the uh, the, the archivist and the and the senate um, you know secretary's office got together at the point really when the when the senate minutes were becoming you know available digital from the you know from their inception a lot of you know administrative units like that were kind of putting up lists of stuff on their web pages and that started to get out of hand and it made obvious sense to get a central repository for it and i believe with the senate materials we sort of did the born digital stuff first and then started backfilling by scanning the material that was in the uh, it was it was in the archives to get a complete record I should an, uh, add to my answer because as Peter was speaking, I was thinking about our Senate and our board documents a little more. <laughs> and as I and I was like, no, Jeff, you were completely wrong about what you just said. So generally speaking, our administrative documents handle are handled the way I, I just said. But for Senate and board, actually, because we were originally putting those older historical documents in, we do still have a relationship with the board. Uh, secretary and the Senate secretary. So we are, because Jasmine was probably asking and kind of like, because she's probably like, you have current board and Senate minutes in. So what's that all about? And so that's what that's all about. We had established the relationship through the archival collection. And now that that's one of the few uh, types of material that continues to this day. Like I, I work directly with uh, the board and Senate secretaries to like get our new uh, board and Senate minutes in Dallas space as well. So it's just like a legacy thing with those, those two particular uh, types of administrative material. That's that's great. Um, yeah, I had a very similar question because I'm interested in, you know, how do we work with like student groups and other <coughs> other groups on campus? So I'm wondering, like, do you do any outreach to different, um, you know, administrative uh, folks or student groups or anything like that to uh, to bring in more content or do you wait for people to like come to you or yeah how does that work we wait um, and people come to us like you know if anyone's interested the way I look at it nowadays I think early on we were trying to do a little more outreach but we just discovered that People, and they're not ready for the, when they don't need you, they don't, they're not interested in what you're saying. You can come and talk to them till you're blown in the face. Like it just doesn't resonate. And if you're interested in contributing to an IR at your institution right now, you're going to do a Google search and you're going to land at that, at the homepage of that thing. And you're just going to, I mean, that's how we do it anyway. And people email us like, um, you know, we get emails from individual students. And then I, so I back it, you know, I go, because we don't want individual students you know, we don't want to work individually with students. It would just be overwhelming. I basically then just push them back to their professor and say, hey, you should talk to your professor about getting um, all of the content for, say, a course based collection together. And then I that's how I that's how we kind of work. But like just to sort of. You know, in terms of like promoting it, there's just there's no people who do come to us, they do find us like it's they just have, you know, it's not that hard to find. This basically. So yeah, we don't do a lot of outreach with students. They just find us. 
I think we've done some. Um, it, 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 in th some things, we sort of feel that there is a mandate that it should be up somewhere. Um, Freedom of Information Act, um, you know, has had an impact on that. If, you know, if the university is likely to get asked for it, why don't you just put it in the IR right from the outset, and then you know anybody who wants it has got it. Uh, I mean, you know, things like um, programs from the art gallery. Um, and again, I'm pretty sure that Hansel did go when I was involved in, in, in going to the art gallery and saying, this is something that, you know, we ought to have. Some of that comes from, we already had some of it in the, in the uh, archives and, you know, in paper and, you know, let's continue that. Um, I don't know about things like minutes of student organizations. Um, certainly, again, Playbills from student theatrical productions, something that the archives has always wanted. And now that they're more likely to be digital, um, they come in that way. Um, but, you know, some of the administrative documents are mandated. And um, I don't know whether, say, the students' union, uh, I'm, I'm not aware that we were, were taking students' union documents. Um, so it's it, we do do some outreach, but it's mostly focused, you know, going after something that the, the you know the archive the, the archivist specifically feels you know ought to be included, or you know, as in, in with the Senate, it was obvious that there was a mandate for that material to be preserved. Um, these days, that that should be done in an open and digital ways. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question uh, from Nicole. I have a question for Jeff. Um, we also have DSpace and use the handle server, but some would prefer we mint DOIs. Have you considered adding DOIs to your DSpace? And if so, would you re retroactively assign or only moving forward? Have we been asked? Yes. Uh, do we do it? No, <laughs> I, I have made one exception with a real obstinate person, <laughs> but generally speaking, no. I mean, the thing about handles and handle server, like so, uh, DOIs are an implementation of a handle server. So when you apply a DOI to a handle, you're applying a handle to a handle, and so to me that doesn't seem to make any sense. So yes, there's a lot of pressure. We get a lot of requests to put DOIs on our handles, uh, but you know. I think the reason, I mean, it works in publishing, right? So if I was to get real big picture about DOIs and handles, the reason we need DOIs is because publishers aren't heritage organizations or memory institutions, right? So they, uh, they have to be held to account. So they have organizations like Crossref and, and um, I think there's another one that does the RDM um, DOIs, but in any event, they're audited, uh, they're audited, right? Because they cannot be counted on to, uh, as, like I say, as a memory institution to be committed to these permanent identifiers. But us in libraries, we're a memory organization. So when we sign a handle to something, it means something. We don't need to be audited by Crossref to make sure, because we're committed to them as permanent things. So that's, anyway, that's my, like if I was to have a real beef with, you know, Skullcoms and the whole landscape around IRs. It, I found it really frustrating when, because people would point to other IRs that were assigning DOIs and they were like, see, they do it at UBC or they do it somewhere else. And I'm like, ah, you don't understand. And so you're trying to have a, a detailed conversation with say a professor about it and they don't get that. They just want the DOI on the thing because it's like a marketing tool, but that's not how we do permanent IDs, right? So anyway. Well, use, yeah. the, use, the, use the handle. Yeah, no, yeah. we don't, we, we rely on the handle simply because we don't have the resources to, you know, to add the DOI work um, and we yeah. think the handles are adequate. The one thing that has come up with me recently is I would like to see a metadata tag add, retroactively added to all of our, our um, article material with a ROAR ID in it, because right now the handles don't lead to, don't resolve to a ROAR ID. And that's, um, you know, this, this is getting into this, do we have too little metadata or too much metadata? Um, this is something where years later I'd look at it and go, yeah, we really ought to put the time into going back into all those records. And, and adding that uh, that ID. Great. Uh, at this point, I'll ask: Are there any questions um, from outside the chat that anyone wants to ask? 
not we'll go back to the chat <laughs> um this question comes from rebecca do you know of strategies to improve discovery through google and other search engines and have you ever noted any challenges with search and discovery when a search engine makes changes to search functions Google Scholar, uh, or well, Google, uh, I'll, I'll just jump in, I guess. Uh, so Google has a fairly good uh, set of instructions for uh, optimizing your uh, IR or at least DSpace for discovery on their platform. So that's sort of what we kind of step through it now, was just to make sure we were, we were following those instructions. And I find that like, like articles come up like right at the top on Google Scholar, like we're right, like I said earlier, like any library catalog would be jealous to have the level of indexing we have, and, and our PDFs are full text indexed as well, right? So when you ingest a PDF into DSpace, it creates a text file and that all gets indexed by Google as well, right? So it, it's really slick and it's, you know, now obviously hitching to the sort of a, a, your wagon to sort of this commercial entity of Google is sort of a bit of a leap. Uh, I do recognize the sort of structural flaw in that approach, but it's it's working out well so far, I guess, is what I would say. And there are instructions. Google does have some instructions on how to optimize uh, for their search engine. Yeah. yeah, putting putting header tags, the header tags you need in so that the Google spiders can find it um, is, you know, was, is fairly straightforward for, you know, people who do that kind of systems work. Uh, one of the challenges we have encountered is going back and putting Google Analytics tags in um, to our, our IR pages um, when Google Analytics, of course, um, completely changed their platform in the middle of last year. Um, and we do, we find um, the the uh, statistics that we get, the usage uh, information we get from Google in a lot of ways superior to anything we're getting from DSpace. So um, uh, that, that was a challenge, but um, but the search, uh, just yeah, I agree with Jeff. Okay, and Dana says Internet Archive Scholar is another interesting place to look. Um, I think we have time for one last question, and it comes from Anne. Uh, what what is the advantage of DSpace over Islandora when we have developers? We're thinking of moving to DSpace. Do you have any experience with this or or does anyone else on the call have experience? That might I, found, share? I found um, Islandora, you know, the uh, Fedora Drupal um, more difficult to manage internally um, when we initially looked at it. And we did have a, uh, a Karn, um, Karn is the Atlantic province's shared instance. We did have a, a Karn, um, you know, instance for a while. Uh, and I, I know other people who've, you know, looked at the at the Islandora stack and and chosen DSpace. DSpace is not without its challenges, as you know, and <laughs> everybody talking about the length of time it takes us to convert from, you know, up to the new version seven. Um, but um, I, I've found it more straightforward. I mean, the other thing is that DSpace is now available from several, uh, you know, cloud-based, um, you know, um, databases of service companies um and um and of course the other problem with islandora right now is that it's it's at end of life and its next version is in the process of development so um but that's very much a choice i know there are people who love islandora it is widely used around the world so um you know you 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 can't you know it's i'm sure you could find an equal number of people you know who would prefer that over dspace Yep, when we uh, the last time we looked at Island Dora, it was many years ago. But at that time, and I don't know if it's changed since, uh, we couldn't migrate our handles over. So I mentioned that was sort of a deal breaker for us. Uh, obviously, um, we we wanted those. So at the time, maybe it has that capacity now. So it was nothing more than that really for us. Uh, but we haven't really looked much at it since. Okay, I think that's. Um... That concludes the session. Those were, that, that's a lot of information for us to take back to our institutions and a lot to think about. So uh, with that, um, I think we'll close the Q&A. 
and uh, conclude our discussion for today on institutional repositories. I do want to say a great big thank you to Jeff Brown and Peter Webster for their time, their presence, and willingness to share their insights with all of us. Um, to everyone who joined on the call today, thank you for attending and contributing to the discussion. Please feel free to reach out to myself uh, if you have any questions or concerns about the session today. And uh, just as a reminder, Cynthia has recorded um, has recorded today's uh, roundtable and will uh, provide a link at a later date. Hey, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jeff and Peter. Hope you all have yep. a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for moderating, Julie.